Welcome to the MOOCs course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Industrial Gases. There are a few gases which are very essential for uh, many of the industrial purposes. Such gases are uh, known as uh, industrial gases and these gases are also produced or manufactured industrially. Right? What are these gases? These are oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon dioxide and noble gases. All of them are having one or other kind of a uh, applications and then some of these things are already known to us. Let us say carbon dioxide in compressed form it is used as a kind of fire extinguisher. In solid form like uh, dry ice it is used as dry ice whereas the hydrogen is often used for uh, many synthesis purposes. Nitrogen is used for the production of ammonia synthesis gas, ammonia, urea and other kind of uh, nitrogen fertilizers. It is sometimes also used as a kind of uh, inert atmosphere for uh, conducting a few reactions where inert atmosphere is essential. Oxygen is often uh, we know it is used for uh, oxidation, partial oxidation or combustion this kind of reaction it is often used. It is also used as a kind of uh, medical uh, requirement as well many times. Okay? So, as we understand that oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen are often used as raw materials for production of other chemicals. Uh, let us say N2 is also used uh, for uh, preserving the flavor of packed material, packed food material especially. How does it uh, prevents the flavor of the packaged food? By reducing the chemical action occurring on them over the time of storage. So that may lead, if there is a chemical action then that may lead to rancidity which is not uh, good from the food point of view or packaged food point of view. So, it is also used for the preservation of food items. Oxygen and helium are essential medicaments. Many of these gases, their liquids and solids for example, liquid CO2 like uh, used for fire extinguisher and dry ice often used for many purposes have a common application in creating cold. Right? So, they are used for creating cold. How they do? Uh, creation of cold for uh, required applications, they do by absorbing the heat upon evaporation or by performing work or by melting. Right? So, since we understand this uh, creating of cold that means there is something uh, which appear or happen at very low temperatures. So, something is happening. So, that whatever the things are happening like you know both production and utilization of these gases that now we can understand that they are happening at low temperatures. So, because of such uh, applications at lower temperatures associated with these gases, there is a special or a new division called cryogenic engineering. Right? So, what is this cryogenic that is what we are going to see. Cryogenics as the name uh, indicate it deals with the production and utilization both not only a production but also utilization also takes place at low temperatures. What is the range of low temperature? It is in general absolute 0 to 123 Kelvin. So, this production and utilization occurring at such low temperatures are often uh, associated with this cryogenics and then cryogenics term is extensively used. So, what is so great about cryogenics? How do we understand how much it is important to study as a separate uh, division? So, some of the applications we see now. We know that uh, use of liquid hydrogen, oxygen and fluorine are used in missiles for military purpose and then space application purpose also they are used something like rocket propulsion etc. So, these are the two important applications if you see from these applications point of view we can understand that how much it is important. because the missiles for military or you know uh, any component associated with the space technology are uh, very expensive and they need to be given at most care for each and every element. So, for those industries if these are uh, going to be useful, so then we must study in detail about this cryogenics. Some advanced application techniques are also uh, developed in the cryogenics engineering division and then these techniques are often used for storage, handling and shipment of very cold liquids and gases. So, they are not only uh, just applications kind of thing, but for the storage also they are very important. Handling and then shipment of very cold liquids and gases also the uh, advanced cryogenic techniques are developed. Cryogenic liquids are often stored and shipped in tanks built in multiple walled vacuum bottle. So, what is so important because now 
obviously uh, whatever the equipment or storage vessels that are available for storing at the atmospheric condition cannot be used the same thing for the uh, for storing the cryogenic material right so then we need to have a separate uh, you know equipment a design so that to you know one can uh, easily store and transport this uh, cryogenic materials okay so we see one example how much it is important to have a knowledge of uh, cryogenic engineering for example we take a oxygen right we take oxygen right if you wanted to store 166 kg of uh, gaseous oxygen at 15 mega pascals you need to have 18 small cylinders which may be weighing approximately 1090 kg but the approximately same weight are slightly higher than the 166 that is 169 kg of liquid o2 if you wanted to store then you need a cylinder which would be weighing only 113 kg that means if you are the same amount of uh, same weight of oxygen if you are storing in gases from at uh, normal conditions then the storing vessels may be weighing almost 10 times higher compared to the same if you are doing at the uh, cryogenic or liquid oxygen conditions okay so this is one example to indicate how much it is essential from the economics point of view also not only from the application point of view cryogenic or super cold temperatures cause fundamental changes in properties of materials because of that one only such kind of uh, changes or advantages we may have now we see major portion of cryogenics industries are found to be occupied by oxygen and nitrogen though there are also like hydrogen and then carbon dioxide in addition to that uh, some noble gases are also there these are also produced commercially right using cryogenic methods so what are we going to see in this lecture and then coming lecture we are going to uh, study the production or purification of air to get oxygen and nitrogen separately okay and then we will be discussing the production of carbon dioxide and hydrogen in the next class so before going to the production of uh, this cryogenic oxygen and nitrogen what we do we see a few applications of cryogenic engineering as i already mentioned that in long range intercontinental ballistic missile system you need them right so in space explorations also something like rocket propulsion also you need them there are also other applications like electronic data processing applied to computers gyroscopes superconductors nuclear fusion power infrared photo optics etc in all these applications also you need a knowledge of cryogenic engineering or you know and this cryogenic material in food preservation also preservation of blood marrow and then human organs also it is used also used in magneting and high vacuum pumping the performance of uh, some materials required you know you need to maintain a low temperature and under such low temperatures if you are pumping the material may be become uh, waxy kind of let us say wax if you wanted to transport if you transport at low temperature that may become much more solidified and then it become very difficult to transport so then you can do you know you can apply this magnetic and high vacuum pumping system to transport such kind of material cryogenic products are used in chemical and metallurgical industries as well for example nitrogen for ammonia production as explained and then use of oxygen low purity oxygen itself if you use then the production of steel in open hearth furnaces converters and in blast furnaces for pig iron increases almost by more than 25% okay now let us say how do you do this one if you wanted to convert a gas into the liquid form what are the things are uh, you supposed to know so one important thing that you need to understand is liquefaction of gases let us say vapors of substances which are liquids at atmospheric conditions if you want to condense them you can condense them by cooling right that we all know let us say however liquefaction of substances if you wanted to those substances are liquid at lower temperature then it is possible to further do the liquefaction of such substances by compression or by a combination of compression and cooling okay so pressure required for liquefaction can be reduced by cooling as well actually liquefaction occurs by increasing the pressure right 
let us say if you take a gas and then if you wanted to liquefy what you have to do you have to give the pressure high pressure you have to apply to that gas so that that gas can be liquefied and then that requirement of high pressure may be reduced if the process is accompanied by cooling as well okay some examples of such gases are ammonia sulfur dioxide methyl chloride fluorocarbons chlorine hydrogen sulfide etc for liquefaction of permanent gases like O2, N2, H2 and helium in addition to compression and cooling it may also be required to have expansion in the process. So, these are actually some cycles are there in cycles these are these kind of compression, expansion, cooling etc are occurring. So, accordingly we have to design a system. To produce liquids from compressed gases they must be cooled by one or more of the following approaches before starting compressing them. So, what are they? Exchange of heat with a colder stream, otherwise expansion through a throttle wall adiabatically which is also known as joule thamson expansion. Also adiabatic expansion against a piston or in a turbine is also another approach in order to get the liquids from the compressed gases. Okay? Work for reversible liquefaction if at all is required may be calculated from the availability increase that is what is the value of delta H minus T delta S. Now what we do? We are going to discuss uh, manufacturing of oxygen and nitrogen. So as any chemical manufacturing that we have been doing whenever we are discuss, start discussing production of any chemical what are we doing? We starting with the properties of the material and then raw materials and then quantitative requirements, flow sheet etc. That is how we are progressing. So here also we are going to do the same thing. So, let us see properties of oxygen and nitrogen. Oxygen molecular weight is 32, melting point is minus 218.8 degree centigrade, boiling point is minus 183 degree centigrade. Grades high purity oxygen if you want then that should be 99.5 percent or more pure and then remaining is balanced by the organ. Low purity oxygen if you want then it should purity should be between 90 to 95 percent and then 4 to 5 percent would be argon and then imbalance is there that is because of balance is due to the N2, CO2 and H2O. Okay? Coming to the nitrogen molecular weight is 28.02, melting point is minus 210 degree centigrade, boiling point is minus 195.8 degree centigrade. Grades technically 99 percent pure N2 is available in general balance is AR or O2 or both of them may be present in remaining 1 percent. So, now we see consumption pattern of O2 and N2. right? So, if not sufficient consumption is there, so then why do we need to you know uh, produce all of them? So, what we have to do? We have to understand the consumption pattern a little bit if not all uh, applications are usage of these two. Let us start with oxygen. High purity oxygen used for welding, metal cutting, open heart steel purification and as well medicinal purposes. And then low purity oxygen used for blast furnace operations and many industrial oxidation processes use often low purity oxygen. Reasons for increasing use of low purity tonnage oxygen compared to the high purity oxygen are because the nitrogen diluent from air not as desirable from rate and equilibrium standpoint and then it saves sensible heat losses from N2 inert, also increases capacity of equipment designed for use of air, then product less dilute in effluent. Coming to the nitrogen, it is used as a protective atmosphere to prevent oxidation in metal working and food preservation. Captive usage is in ammonia and then nitrogen chemicals production. Liquid nitrogen used for repressive cooling, transportation industry as well. Okay? Now, we will see methods of production of O2 and N2. All major production methods are based on liquefaction followed by subsequent fractionation of air. So, if all the methods are based on the same principle, so then what are the difference or you know why do we need to study all different methods? So, there may be some uh, variations, small small variations from one plant to the other plant and most importantly these O2 and N2 are often produced on site especially from industrial applications point of view this O2 and N2 are produced on site 
especially for industrial applications viewpoint. Okay? So, from one industry to the other industry situations may be different or from one application to the other application may be very different. So, depending on these kind of uh, variations, there may be slight variations in production methods from one industry or production of this O2 and N2 from one on-site production to the other on-site productions. So, what are these possible variations? Variations in compression, purification and refrigeration cycles, then variations in equipment design for all major unit operations such as heat exchange, rectification, gas compression and expansion. So, specific process cycle nomenclatures are there which are very well established. We see couple of them. One is the Linde cycle that uses refrigeration by joule thamson cooling. Another one is the Claude cycle obtains refrigeration by adiabatic expansion of compressed air in a turbo reciprocating or rotating expansion machine. Right? So, but however, this is very conventional one and then we are going to see this Linde Frankel cycle for the production of low purity tonnage oxygen. So, Linde Frankel cycle for low purity oxygen that process we are going to see now. Okay? So, obviously raw materials is the starting point. What is the raw material for production of oxygen and nitrogen? Any plant you take, the naturally available air is a raw material. Okay? So, the air that is having composition usually N2 78.03 percent, O2 20.97 percent, right? remaining are argon, hydrogen, CO2 and then H2 etcetera would be there. Right? So, the natural air is taken as raw material. Minor quantities of sodium hydroxide, ammonia and silica gel are also are used in general in application. Why they are used? For purification or for removing the CO2 H2O purpose, these are used. These chemicals are required in minor quantities only. Quantitative requirements point of view if you see, if you wanted to produce 1 ton of 95 percent pure oxygen in a 300 tons per day plant, so then how much air is required? 3600 normal cubic meters of air is required. Steam 1.75 tons required, cooling water 5 tons required, electricity 450 to 480 kilowatt hours required. Plant capacity is usually between 50 to 500 tons per day. Okay? So, for removing of uh, CO2 some chemical reactions may also take place with NaOH for example, then 2 NaOH plus CO2 giving rise to sodium carbonate along with the water. This is the chemical reaction often involved that is also if there is a CO2 and then if you wanted to remove it by scrubbing with sodium hydroxide solution. Okay? Now, we see process description then we are going to see the same thing in flow sheet as well. Okay? The feed air is compressed to 4 to 5 atmosphere. After compressing it is cooled with water prior to passing it into regenerative exchanges. These regenerative exchanges are very important aspects of the process because in other process or probably up to this uh, exchanges step whatever is there that is the only different from one process to the other process. After crossing this uh, exchanges step whatever the remaining fractionation of air etc are there, they are same. Let us say now we are discussing uh, low purity oxygen production right? using this uh, Linde Frankel uh, cycle. Right? If you wanted to produce high purity oxygen using the Kellogg cycle, then what we will be having? Only these regenerative exchanges would be replaced by recuperative exchanges and then after that whatever the fractionation of air etc are there that is same here and then other process that is Kellogg process as well. So, what are these regenerative exchanges? They are actually operating in pairs. These are uh, from the equipment or uh, from the unit operations point of view, these are physical pressure vessels packed with aluminum spirals. So, they are uh, cylindrical in uh, shape and then inside these uh, pressure vessels there is a aluminum spirals packing as well. So, both of them are having some purpose. Okay? Now, one exchanger is used for air cooling okay? because I said you know they are operating in pairs. So, two are there. Okay? One is used for air cooling while the cold product gas which is containing N2 and O2 is removing sensible heat 
from the packing in the other exchanger. What is the packing? Aluminum spirals. So, from them sensible heat is being removed you know by the product gases in the other exchanger because there are two exchanges they are operating in pairs. Okay? And then these cycles are reversed by automatic walls after 2 to 4 minutes depending on the plant to plant for effective use of exchanges. That is first you know let us say uh, exchanger 1 is used for air cooling, exchanger 2 is used for uh, removing the sensible heat from the packing material. When we do the reversing of the cycle, the exchanger 1 would be used for uh, uh, removing the sensible heat from the packaging that is present in the first exchanger whereas the second exchanger would be used for air cooling because the both of them are having aluminum spirals packing and then designed such a way. Okay? And then water and carbon dioxide should not be there in the air, they must be removed before sending it to the fractionation section. Basically crudely in a layman language if you wanted to understand this process, what is this process of production of O2 and N2? You have two steps, one is the exchange steps and then another one is the fractionation step. Before the exchange step there is a compressor is used for the drying of the air, right? After drying the air is cooled and then sent to the exchanges. In the exchanges two actions are taking place, air is being cooled in one exchanger and another exchanger sensible heat is being removed. Right, so then cycles interchange after every 2 to 4 minutes. So, uh, after that whatever the product gases N2O2 are there, so they should be sent to the fractionation section. They should be sent to fractionation section, but what we have to make sure that before sending to the fractionation section water and carbon dioxide should be removed. Not only water and carbon dioxide, if at all any hydrocarbons also present then they should also be removed. From what is the source of these hydrocarbons you may be thinking but as I mentioned most of these plants are installed on site wherever let us say you have ammonia production plant. There you need pure nitrogen, hydrogen may be you getting by uh, different uh, methods uh, of the synthesis gas production that we have seen in the previous section. Nitrogen you have to get by this method or the other method that we are going to study after this method. So, there if in, since the, in the on site it is there or it is required for a partial oxidation, oxygen pure or low purity oxygen is required for the partial oxidation or combustion of some of the uh, components in the fuel industry. So then obviously the surrounding atmosphere may be contaminated with the hydrocarbons as well. So then there is a possibility of hydrocarbons present as well in the air. So they should also be removed. Okay? So how do we do? That part of the removal of this can also be done in the uh, exchanges how that we see. After removing these impurities, air enters the fractionation section operates at minus 183 to minus 195 degrees centigrade to prevent plugging. So how this uh, removal takes place? These impurities are removed on cold packing throughout the exchanger, whatever the exchanger that we have then. In cold packing these impurities are removed and then re-evaporated by product gas whatever N2O2 product gases are there which starts with zero concentration of H2 and then CO2. Then thus this will provide an equilibrium driving force for the vaporization process as well. So often in this type of cycle impurities cannot be removed completely and then obviously you can produce low purity product gas, product may be O2 or N2 or both. Okay? So air leaving the regenerative heat exchangers is cooled to minus 170 degrees centigrade and fed to a reboiler section of the double column where further cooling takes place. What is this double column? Right? That we are going to see now. Okay? So double column are two distillation columns that is two distillation column are there, one is uh, mounted onto the other. Okay? So one is standing on to the other with low pressure column which is operating at 1.4 atmospheric conditions, pressure conditions that is standing on a top of high pressure column that is operating at 5.7 atmosphere column. Reboiler of upper column working as condenser of vapors uh, from the lower column. Okay? In high pressure section more volatile N2 out of this O2 and N2. N2 is more volatile and then it reaches the top of the column easily 
and is condensed inside the tubes of revolver of low pressure column by liquid O2 surrounding the tubes. Let us say simply we are going to see the flow sheet also. So, there is one column, another column is there like this. So, in between there is a heat exchanger. These columns are provided with uh, some kind of trays. Number of trays or stages required for distillation that one has to calculate all those things from the mass transfer principle that is different thing. Now, this is operating at uh, 5.7 atmosphere this is operating at 1.4 atmosphere. So, whatever the O2 N2 is there, so uh, be, that is entering uh, from the uh, reboiler section of the lower column and then since N2 is the low volatile thing, so that moves up like this, right. So, this uh, more volatile N2 reaches the top of the column and is condensed inside the reboiler of low pressure column. Here it actually here itself there is a reboiler should be there. So, that will be you know in that it is getting condensed right. How it is getting condensed? Because liquid O2 is surrounding the tubes right. So, this is accomplished because the temperature of liquid oxygen at 1.4 atmosphere is lower than the condensation temperature of saturated nitrogen vapor at 5.7 atmosphere. So, because of this region you need to have a condensation temperature of standard nitrogen is required. Condensation of standard nitrogen is required so that you can get the saturated nitrogen vapor and then that is possible at 5.7 atmosphere. That is the reason lower column is operating at the 5.7 atmosphere and then nitrogen as it moves up and then reaches the top of the uh, lower column, it get condensed in the reboiler of the top column. Okay? So, the condensers are provided at the top usually reboilers are uh, provided at the bottom at usually at the bottom. Okay? So, for both of the columns there would be a condenser, there would be a reboiler. So, now here it is a reboiler is there. So, whatever the condenser is there or whatever the reboiler of the top column is there, they are same, they are doing the combined operation for them. For one column it is operating as a kind of reboiler, other one it is for the top one it is operating as a reboiler, for the bottom one it is operating as a condenser. Right? So, because of that this uh, pressure difference you know uh, the nitrogen gets uh, saturated, you get the saturated nitrogen and then that is being condensed in the reboiler of the top column that is top column is nothing but the low pressure column and then it is get condensed. How it is get condensed? Because the surrounding tubes are occupied by the liquid O2. This condensed nitrogen is then sprayed into the top of low pressure column for reflux as well. Less volatile oxygen still containing 50 percent N2 is pumped to the middle of low pressure column that is top column where final rectification takes place. Right? So, next slide is the flow sheet is there. So, here we can clearly see. Okay? So, let us say we have a air that has to be compressed through turbo compressor at 4 atmosphere so that to dry it after drying, when you do the drying, water vapors kind of things would be removed by this compression process and then that after removing the uh, water vapors etc., that will be passed through a cooler and then after cooling, you know, you have uh, two options. One option is that the air is going to N2 regenerator. This is nothing but whatever the exchanges, uh, regenerative exchanges that we have uh, discussed in the text previous slides, these are nothing but this one. They work in the pairs. So, for one N2, one pair, for O2, another pair. So, whatever the air comes here, so that will be you know regenerated and then here in this case, in this first let us say first this is the first column, here cooling is taking place. In the second column what will happen? It will be removing the sensible heat from these aluminum spirals that are present. These aluminum spirals are present in both the columns, here oxygen also the same thing. So, that after removing the sensible heat from the second column, N2 product is collected if it is of sufficient purity. Otherwise, it is sent back to the uh, regenerative heat exchanger again and the cycle continues. Similarly, whatever the air is there, cooled air after uh, removing the uh, water vapors etc., that will also go to oxygen regenerative 
exchanges, right. So, these exchanges now here again same process takes place here cooling of uh, air takes place and then here the removing of sensible heat uh, from the spirals takes place and this cycle continues and from this one if the outlet is having sufficient purity oxygen you can take collect it as a product otherwise you can send back, right. So, one cycle continues like this for 2 to 4 minutes, after that they interchange their duties. Now, the first one would be used for uh, sensible heat removal, second one would be used for uh, cooling the air, same is here also. This cycle continues, right. So, now once you get the sufficiently dry air without uh, H2 etc., then this product O2 N2 would be taken to the fractionation column, right. Where are we feeding it? We are feeding it in the, this is nothing but a reboiler of bottom column. Fractionation column, we understand it is two uh, double column or two uh, distillation columns. Lower one is operating at 5.7 atmosphere, the top one is operating at 1.4 atmosphere, right. So, when this O2 and N2 are the products they are actually coming here. So, when it is coming N2 is more volatile, so it passes through right and then here when it pass through this uh, reboiler of the top column right. Now, this section is reboiler for top column and then condenser for lower column. So, since it is a condenser for lower column, so then what happens? So, whatever the pure nitrogen while it is passing through, it will be condensed because of the surrounding liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is surrounding the tubes. So, when the nitrogen passes through the tubes, that will be condensed, right? And then that you can take it as a product or you can take liquid into cooler and then send to the cold reversing walls and then warm reversing walls and this cycle continues like this, right. Or you can take them to the N2 exchange and then further passing through the switch exchanger you can get the N2 product. So, more purified N2 you get it here and then liquid O2 you will be getting in the reboiler of the or towards the reboiler of the lower column you will be getting the pure O2, okay. This cycle continues like this. Sometimes what happens you know on the air that we are uh, taking that may also have CO2 also, so that has to be removed. Let us say CO2 if you wanted to remove, there are one option is that after this process, after this uh, heat exchanges or uh, regenerative exchanges, after this step you can have this scrubbing with NaOH before feeding it to the fractionation column. Before feeding it to the fractionation column, you can have this uh, section here and then remove CO2 in the form of Na2CO3 and then plus H2O, okay. One other option is that if the CO2 is very less, so then what you can do? You can bypass some amount, 5 percent of air after cooling, One from the inlet you know you are compressing and then cooling it. After this cooling, whatever the air is there, 5 percent you can take and then it pass it through CO2 scrubbing tower, right. Here from the top you give NaOH solutions um, by pump and then from the bottom you give the air which is containing CO2 also. So, that CO2 would be get absorbed and then as a solution you get uh, Na2CO3. So, uh, from the top you get air without uh, CO2 and then you pass through this air high pressure compressor for the uh, removing any water etc. that is present because when this uh, reaction is taking place to remove CO2 by NaOH, we have seen the reaction not only Na2CO3 is forming but also H2O forming. When it is forming, so then it obviously it is possible that air may be wet, so that has to be dried. How you do in drying of the air? By passing through high pressure compressor. So, when you do this drying, so obviously air would become hot, so then that has to be cooled and then it has to be passed through the circle again or you can take it to the ammonia core cooler and then ammonia condenser etc. as per the applications. Whereas, the sodium carbonate solution whatever is there that is pumped through and then recycle after regeneration etc. that continues it, okay. So, this is the uh, process to get low purity tonnage oxygen production.
in addition to nitrogen production as well. So, if argon which boils at 2.9 degree centigrade lower than oxygen is also present as impurity, its removal requires much larger number of plates in the columns. In the fractionation column, these are nothing but the, these indicating the plates. Large number of plates may be required. If you wanted to go for the you know uh, high purity, any of the chemicals that you wanted to purify by distillation, if the required uh, purity is very high, so then co distillation column height would be high, uh, very large value and then number of plates would also be large. Such designs are used only for high purity oxygen product that we are going to see next slide. Some amount of compressed air is drawn as side stream before entering the regenerators. This is to facilitate heat balance not only for removing CO2 as we have shown in the previous slide, but also it is suitable or you know uh, very uh, useful for heat balance. Heat balance has to be maintained in the plant okay? and flow control in the cycle as well. The air is dried and freed of CO2 by NaOH scrubbing tower as explained previous slide. The purified air is compressed to 200 atmosphere, then cooled by water and then ammonia refrigeration and nitrogen product heat exchange before entering a turbo expander operating on Claude principle. This balancing stream of cold air is fed near the bottom of lower pressure column that is at the middle between the two columns. Now what we do? We see Kellogg low pressure cycle for high purity oxygen. So, process description as I mentioned use of recuperative reversing heat exchanger is the only or main difference between Kellogg cycle that we are going to see and then Linde Frankel cycle that we have already seen in the previous slide. These are built in a concentric triple tube design with high purity O2 moving through inner tube without contacting incoming air. This is known as recuperative heat exchanger. Reversing principle is used to remove CO2 and then H2O from the incoming air stream by switching flow of N2 product stream and air stream in outer two annulae. Other purification details include catalytic oxidation chamber inserted after the initial compression to 70 PSIG to convert hydrocarbons to CO2 and H2O if at all hydrocarbons are present in the air. Silica gel filter ahead of the double column is used to remove if any water or CO2s are present. Let us say the same thing is uh, schematically shown here. See after this recuperative heat exchanger unit, so whatever this section is there that is same, that is same as the previous one that is double column uh, distillation or two distillation columns one on to the other all those things are same again here also. Okay? So, this should be 5.7 atmosphere. right? So, in addition to that one what we have, see these are the concentric triple tube design uh, recuperative heat exchangers through the uh, center one purified O2 is passing through and then the outermost one and air is uh, flowing through the outermost one without interacting with the purified oxygen. So, that is the advantage of this one. After this, this process is again the same as what we have seen in the previous slide. Other cycles are also there, some modification something like that. Modification in Linde Frankel cycle include various chemical methods for removing water and carbon dioxide and then operating at pressures as high as 200 atmospheres. However, another process that is Iliot process does not use air expansion for refrigeration, but sets up heat exchange with O2 coolant in strictly recuperative heat exchangers. This design eliminates the heat balance control stream, but requires cleaning the heat exchangers by melt down every 3 to 5 hours. Cloud A operated processes use adiabatic expansion of 70 to 80 percent of incoming air from 25 to 50 atmosphere to 5 to 7 atmosphere column pressure. Cycles also differ in detail of separation of products, how the separation is being done. So, liquid products can be drawn directly from the column, rare gases can also be separated that is argon side streamed for a fractionation from residual N2 and then O2 in separate column. 
or neon helium from N2 product by venting from top of main condenser or krypton xenon from O2 product by adsorption from top of main condenser. Okay? So, whatever the cycles that we have seen for the production of low purity oxygen or high purity oxygen, you now they seems to be simple and then having only a compression and expansion kind of units, but however there are certain kind of engineering problems associated with these cycles as well and then one must be careful about them. What are they? Complete removal of water is one problem, similarly complete removal of carbon dioxide is also another problem and then hydrocarbons to prevent plugging in low temperature sections of plant is also a problem. Had it not been a low temperature process then removal of these things might not be a difficult at all. Right? Since the process are a low temperature cryogenic processes, the removal of these uh, impurities become very difficult and especially these impurities like uh, hydrocarbons etc. are dangerous if they are present in oxygen use that is going to be used for medical requirements. Developing effective low temperature insulation and lubricants also. Sometimes you need lubrication design from the connections etc. But the temperature if very low temperature then these lubricants may become solidified. So that is one problem. Complex heat balancing designs is also another problem and then prevention of explosive mixtures in oxygen rich regions is another very big danger. From the economics point of view, nearly all of O2 produced is high purity and used mostly for oxyacetylene welding and cutting processes. Enriched air and pressurized uh, blast furnace operations in steel industry also require this oxygens. Another major use of O2 is for production of synthesis gas by partial oxidation and then nitrogen is used for the production of ammonia and then several types of nitrogen fertilizers etc. Okay. The references uh, for this lecture are provided here, but most of the notes is prepared from these two reference books. Thank you.